thanks for having me, Brandon. I really, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. So uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion. Um, yeah, so I, I guess uh, a little bit about chemical concepts. I mean, what we do is we're really uh, product assembly people. Um, so whether it's uh, manufacturers, engineers, uh, anybody putting things together, uh, they come to us when they need uh, um, really solutions involving, uh, you know, our core products are adhesive, sealants, tapes, uh, specialty fasteners. Um, so if they're looking for process improvements or they're looking to, uh, you know, have some kind of better performance in some way or another, uh, or having some kind of engineering challenge that they're trying to solve, you know, they come to us and we try and, you know, kind of use our expertise in those areas to, to put something together for them. So we're, we're involved in a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different industries. Um, so, you know, a lot of the collaboration that we do with you guys is in the cladding facade market. We're also involved in you know, people putting, like I said, anything together, whether it's a bus or, you know, transportation, even in, you know, kitchen countertops, it's, <laughs> it's a pretty wide gamut, anyone that's using adhesives or fasteners. So it's a fun thing. We get to, you know, kind of do something different every day, <laughs> you know, it is a family business, you know, to answer part two of your question. Uh, and I was kind of born into this. So I'm a, a, a third, third generation here. I'm, I'm the uh, national sales manager. Um, and it was, the, the company was founded by my, uh, my great uncle. Um, and it's, you know, coming up next year is actually going to be the, the 60 year anniversary. So we're really, uh, really excited about that. We are uh, a, you know, most of our, we're kind of a weird kind of company and it's just the way things have evolved. But, um, you know, we're both a distributor and a manufacturer. There's some items that we've kind of developed over the years, but I, I guess primarily we're a distributor. So the, the genesis of this product we were, we're the uh, North American uh, master distributor of, of, uh, of a company out of Italy called Special Insert. And um, they've developed all these innovative fastening solutions. And, um, you know, they've got a really strong R&D department. They've, they've got some really smart people that have come up with some really innovative uh, types of fasteners. Um, and we just saw them as really a great fit for us in terms of what we were doing with adhesives and sealants. And, and that's it's through them is really what we've kind of branched out into, into these specialty fasteners. Because, you know, for a long time, we kind of competed against fastening, you know, kind of in a big conceptual sense. You know, it's like, well, don't use a fastener, use an adhesive. But uh, we found so many applications where, you know, people were looking for an adhesive in conjunction, you know, a fastener in conjunction with an adhesive or you know, just looking to help you know, the, the best way for people to put X together, you know, so sometimes the right answer is a fastener. So they developed the deform nut. It's a patented system. Um, they'll probably yell at me for getting the exact year wrong. I believe the deform nut's probably around uh, five years old or, or, or something like that. I would put it in that neighborhood. We've used the kind of the term um, deform nut in, in the context that we're talking about. So that's actually the product to go way, way back, that's actually the product that kind of special, that special insert was kind of founded on was, uh, it's a specialty type of, of rivet nut. Um, and if, you know, if you're familiar with rivet nuts, you can go ahead and Google them. I won't spend too much time dog earing into that. But um, so I, I just kind of say that as shorthand, but really the deform nut is a kind of rivet nut. Rivet nut technology has been around, you know, for a long time. It's, it's they're kind of neat fasteners that kind of act like a rivet, but give you a female uh, mechanical anchor. Um, and what we're really talking about is the deform nut TC slash DM, which is the, the specific, the specific series. So they've special insert has sold standard, you know, rivet nuts, standard deform nuts for, you know, probably 30 plus years. I know their company goes back three generations too. Um, and, uh, but the problem the people came to the special insert engineers and they were looking for a problem. The problem they were trying to solve was anchoring into hollow core materials. So that could be, uh, you know, honeycomb sandwich panels, which is primarily what you and I've been working on. Uh, could be other kinds of composite sandwich panels. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of solutions that kind of existed for solid materials. If it's, you know, sheet goods, sheet metals, um, but with these new kind of composites that have been out there, and I use the word new, I mean, they've been using these things in aerospace for 30 or 40 years, but it's still kind of in these composites are always evolving. Um, and uh, it's just been a challenge. How do you, how do you have us create a secure connection into a, a solid core, uh, into a hollow core material? So that's that's what the, the problem the deform nut solves. So uh, it's, a, it's a two step, um, fastener basically so that it, 
the part, one component of it is a deformed nut where you drill a hole into the panel. Uh, the deformed nut is inserted using a rivet tool kind of machine. Uh, it crimps or deforms the backside. Once it's inserted, the backside of it is deformed around the, the skin of the panel uh, so that it's kind of crimped between the, 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 the face of the rivet and um, the part that's just been deformed around it. Uh, so that gives you a secure connection to the face, uh, but the face of the panel is not really the structural component of a, of a honeycomb panel. If we're talking about honeycomb panels, actually the honeycomb core itself is really the structural component. So that gives you kind of a starting point. Then uh, using a structural adhesive is injected into the hole. And then a secondary screw they call the grub screw uh, is inserted while the adhesive is still wet. And when the whole thing is said and done, you have a uh, adhesive connection to the back face, you have a rivet connection to the front face, and then that grub screw is potted into the whole center. So you're, you have a struct, you're structurally bonded to the surrounding honeycomb cells. Um, so you basically are connecting to all three components of the deform of the honeycomb panel. Uh, and once that ad structural adhesive cures, uh, you know, you've got a really, really strong connection. I mean, we're talking, uh, you know, you and I have seen on some of the projects we've worked with, we've had to do pull testing for, you know, some of the exterior building facades. They required pull testings uh, on the systems. Uh, and, you know, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head some of the values, but I believe we're in the one or 2,000 pound, they're in like the 2,000 pound range in, in terms of, uh, definitely in terms of shear, I think in a similar range in terms of tensile. And, you know, when we were doing the shear pulls, I mean, we were shearing the bolts, <laughs> you know, off, uh, which is certainly what we like to see. Um, and uh, your other part of your question was, how is it different? Um, so I'm not aware of, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it is a patented system. I'm not aware of anything exactly quite like it. Um, there are anchors that just require, you basically just pot a female insert into the uh, into the honeycomb is that some competitive systems out there. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenges associated with that where you have to be, you know, very careful. You have to be careful how you position things. There's nothing kind of holding the female anchor kind of in place while the adhesive cures. Um, so there's kind of a lot that can kind of go wrong in that scenario. And then you're really just relying on the adhesive only where, you know, a lot of people like the fact that this is kind of a combination mechanical, um, and uh, um, adhesive uh, uh, connection. Uh, and what happens is that even when the adhesive cures, a lot of engineers get scared about adhesives, which, you know, having an adhesive background, uh, you know, I, I get a little sensitive to that, but because I know what these adhesives can do, but, but still when that adhesive cures, you end up with like a mass of adhesive that's bigger than the hole that you drilled. So that's really mechanical too. Once that's solid, a solid mass, it can't come out unless you pull the whole panel apart. So it is actually mechanical once it cures. So, um, and then the other types of systems that I've seen, uh, you it basically involve in, it, putting an anchor in place while you're manufacturing the panel. So you, you have your, your sheet metal, you put your honeycomb core on top, then you put an anchor in, and then you lay the skin on top with the adhesive and put it in your press. Uh, and so it's kind of baked into the panel. So that's a good solution. I mean, it, 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 they work well, they're strong, they're inexpensive, but when we get on projects, they don't always have the luxury of knowing yeah. where the pa where the anchor points are going to be when the panel's manufactured. And we work with a lot of people that are kind of, s that do kind of basically secondary operations where they're buying panels that are already manufactured and cutting them down and then gluing some kind of material to the face. So if they wanna have a, a, a stone facade on a building with a honeycomb backer or a porcelain facade with a honeycomb backer or some other kind of material, um, you know, it's usually not, I guess you would say the OEM of the panel that's, that's really involved in doing the work. So they don't have the opportunity to put in the anchors when the composite panel is manufactured they only want to put in the anchors after this after their new decorative skin is laminated on so th that's kind of the i guess the little the landscape of you know what we're kind of competing against and and how we're a little bit different so uh to, to install the anchor itself you, you know you need the anchors and the anchors are two parts like i mentioned there's the deformed nut and then the, the grub screw so when you buy a set it comes like that uh you'll need a drill bit of the right size it's a it's a 13 millimeter drill bit and we usually recommend 
uh, like what they call an end mill cutter. So it's uh, instead of just like a regular drill bit, like what they call jobber bits or that you would find at the hardware store, this kind of drills a flat bottomed hole, uh, which is important so that you make sure you're clearing out all of the, um, you, you want to drill through the honeycomb, clear out the aluminum shavings that would be in the middle of the honeycomb. Uh, and then also you want to take off that layer of cured epoxy from the bottom of the, uh, the, the, the reverse side of the panel so that you're giving a nice clean surface for the adhesive to kind of grab onto. So it's important to have, you know, it's like a four fluted uh, end mill cutter is what they're called. Uh, we do sell those bits and, you know, frankly, you can get them on Amazon and other places where you just, you know, once we give you the specifications. So, uh, but we do as a convenience sell the bits. Um, then you just need some kind of rivet tool. Uh, there's manual and pneumatic tools. Uh, if you're doing a small project, the manual tools work fine. They're relatively inexpensive. Uh, I think they're, you know, hundred bucks or less um, for, for one of those, you know, we sell them. There's, there's other kind of rivet tools available because, you know, like I said earlier, rivet nut technology has kind of been around for a long time. So, uh, you know, we're, we're not the exclusive source for that kind of machinery. So you have flexibility in terms of, you know, getting the equipment, you know, we're really not out here to, to own you in terms of all the equipment. Uh, we just want to, again, help you out with, the, with your projects. Um, and then uh, the, the, with the pneumatic tools, if you're really doing, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that we're targeting is, you know, you know, facades of, you know, relatively large commercial buildings where, you know, there could be many hundreds or even thousands of individual panels, uh, you know, and each panel might have, you know, eight or 10 fasteners. So, depending on the sizes of the panels, we could be talking tens of thousands of fasteners. So th in those cases, you know, the pneumatic machines definitely make sense. Um, we've got a good video kind of demonstrating the pneumatic tool where you see it kind of, it, it inserts the tool, crimps it, and then unthreads itself in like one pull of the trigger. So it, it's, a, it's a huge time saver. You know, those tools are, are relatively expensive, but you know, they're certainly worth it in terms of, you know, man hours is always the biggest concern that, that everybody has. And just the last thing you need is adhesive. So we sell the adhesive that goes along with it. Um, and then those come in, again, depending on the scale of the job, you might need a small cartridge of adhesive or big ones if you're if you're doing really a lot of these. And then um, what we sell is a, a, a two-part structural acrylic adhesive that fits in a little cartridge gun. You know, maybe you've seen these kinds of systems where, you know, it's a, it's a two-part system. It's, a, it's kind of like a double barrel caulking gun kind of thing, if you can imagine that. Um, and we sell the dispensers for that as well. So that that's basically all you would need. And then, um, you know, you're going to connect that presumably to some kind of rail system like, like you know, you guys at Monarch provide. Uh, and then you would just need, uh, you know, a bolt to, to connect the, uh, the two systems. And, and we could certainly help you source uh, you know, the, the bolts that meet your requirements for the, 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 the thickness of the honeycomb that you're using and, and you know, that matches all your other technical requirements in terms of, you know, kind of metal you need. Do you want 316 stainless, all, all that. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool technology. Um, and it, it basically, most of these honeycomb panels have uh, an aluminum core. And we say honeycomb, if you look at it, you see all these little kind of hex hexagonal cells of honeycomb, of, of uh, aluminum. Um, and uh, so when you have a front skin and a back skin and that kind of honeycomb matrix of aluminum in the middle that has a lot of air in it, you know, you end up with a very lightweight panel uh, that's also very rigid. Um, and so that combination of lightweight and rigidity really solves a lot of problems that engineers are looking for. And, and that's the reason these kinds of materials are used in aerospace, they're used in rail and in transportation. You know, we sell deformed nuts for those applications where they're putting, you know, you know, put trying to attach chairs to a honeycomb floor of a of a train. You know, and they want to figure out a way to attach uh, the the seating to that. Um, and uh, you know, what we're seeing now too is in, in terms of facades, you're you're kind of seeing a. You know, my understanding again, I'm a my background is, is adhesives and fasteners, and I've learned a lot about these industries from participating in it. But I, I want to pretend to be an expert in facades and all that, but. You know, a lot of my understanding is that a lot of these designs are kind of things that are going on in Europe where you're seeing, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, more of these ventilated kind of facade kind of designs coming over. There's a lot of uh, environmental benefits to those. Um, 
and people love the look, you know, from an architectural design standpoint, you know, people love the look of natural stone. It's a natural product. It's, it's sustainable, you know, sustainability is another kind of trend that, that this touches on where, you know, in, in the US we have lead points and all these kinds of things where uh, government programs that are incentivizing companies to build green, you know, green building is on the minds of a lot of architects anyway, even without the government people, uh, companies, private companies want to stake their claim out there that they're doing the right things for the environment and, and, and rightly so. Um, so if you could use a sustainable product, but there's a lot of technical challenges that come with natural stone, as beautiful it is as, and, as, and as good for the environment as it is compared to other building materials. So if you want to get a three centimeter thick piece of uh, granite and put it 20 stories up on a building, you can imagine, or even a hundred stories or you know whatever it is, you, you could imagine the, uh, the the kinds of engineering challenges that that poses. So, what people with these that this is probably the biggest thing that we see driving that is in the natural and, and artificial man-made stone kind of world. Um, people want that look of natural stone, but they want the lightweight. They want ease of installation. So the end users want it. The engineers want it. The installers want it. It saves everybody a lot of time and money basically throughout the process from. Uh, from install to while it's in use to, to engineering, etc. So, it, it, you know, you, you, it's more cost intensive in terms of the fabrication of it rather than just cutting stone to size. Now you got to cut the stone to size. You got to cut the stone very thin. You got to laminate it to the honeycomb panel. So there's a bit more work on the back end, uh, but it saves a lot of work from every stage from that point on. Um, and that's that's those are the big driving factors. The the need for lightweight the uh, environmental friendliness um, and uh, yeah, just a lot of the logistical challenges too. Those are kind of what we see driving everything. Yeah, I don't know about misconceptions. I think that still in the awareness, you know, it's a, obviously it's a it's a very, very niche product. I mean, it, 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 it caters to a very specific application. So if you've never done exactly this and you've never come across us before, you know, it's also a European product that's relatively new to North America. So I think awareness is probably the biggest thing that we face, which is, you know, we talk to people and they say, you know, someone told me to call you or I'm not sure what to do. I found this online or, you know, this is what we're trying to do. We, we don't know how to do it. Uh, and so it's really just explaining the entire system from the beginning to them. Um, yeah, I think really once they come to us and we kind of walk them through what they have to do, I think we're probably able to manage most of the unknowns uh, from the beginning. Uh, I guess it's just a matter of understanding, uh, you know, the, the alternatives, how this compared to the alternatives and just trying to figure out what's the best fit for, for you and what we're trying to do and what you're trying to do. But, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's not really a lot of options. So if you, uh, if you want to do this, if you have a honeycomb panel, you want to anchor it, um, you know, there's very few, you know, existing systems that are just kind of ready to go and, and have clear instructions and all that. So that's kind of what we try and bring to bring to the table there. Yeah, there's, there's been some, you know, it's exciting because, uh, it, it's fun to take something and, and kind of something new and kind of put it out into the marketplace. And there's a lot of challenges associated with that. Um, um, but what we're fortunate to have is, you know, the track record in Europe, and then we're just basically trying to you know, replicate that success in the U.S. and the U.S. has its own kind of regulatory hurdles. So it's that's not our background. You know, we're we're new to the facade, newish to the facade industry. You know, we've been in industrial markets for a long time, so having to navigate and learn all the players and it's 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 been definitely a learning experience. But um, you know, in the U.S., from my understanding, is is kind of a patchwork of of you know in terms of regulatory and testing of what's required you know there's 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 not really one like in europe they've done a good job i guess in terms of making things very simple uh from the liability standpoint very simple from an, a, a market approach standpoint where they have an eta certification once it's certified it's certified um and they you know cost it very expensive to do the certified but once the product is certified the liability said well you know what this product was tested um, that, you know, that liability isn't on the manufacturer anymore where, you know, they use the tested product, you know, they've done their due diligence and that's basically a stamp of, of approval on there. There's not really an equivalent to that in my understanding of, you know, there's, there's like regional things. So if you're in Miami, they have, you know, the Miami Dade, uh, NOAs where they want to make sure it's hurricane resistant. You go to California, there's special kind of earthquake resistance things. There's a lot of local things. There's ASTM tests. 
but you know the tests aren't quite certifications. Um, it, the liability is still on the engineer to basically put their signature on that and say, you know, we approve that we've done our due diligence, and where they're kind of accepting that, and and you know we're a very litigious society, so of course you know those things kind of flow outward from there that liability to everybody and, and their brother involved. Um, but all that being said, I mean. Um, We've done te we've done ASTM tests, we've done Tensil, we've done Shear. Um, there's been some uh, mock-ups uh, that have been done. Uh, there's been uh, some projectile testing for the that's part of the uh, the Miami Dade uh, uh, NOAs. That I'm still kind of waiting on the, uh, a status of that, but I've seen some of the videos. That, basically what they do is they, they they have a two by four cannon <laughs> and they they shoot a two by four at a, at a mock-up, um, and so. You know that's always fun to see there's always that when you see those kinds of things and you get involved in that there's the little kid in you that just you know loves to see uh things kind of getting blown up i guess <laughs> um but that's kind of cool to see uh, but yeah we did you know so far we've met every expectation in terms of uh what kind of testing we've thrown at it and uh, i'm sure there's going to be more stuff that people are going to throw at us uh you know in the future you know i'll give my two cents and uh you know the industry veterans who may or may not be watching this can just kind of snicker at me if they want i guess but um uh, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of back to my earlier answer, you know, we're definitely seeing more of a, uh, of, of a focus on these ventilated facades, you know, we're seeing the, uh, you know, the green building kind of trend in terms of that being more important to companies. And that's kind of a push pull thing. You see the regulations are, are pushing and then the companies are kind of want to do more. They want to showcase their credentials in terms of how uh, green they are and, you know, their commitment to sustainability and all that. So. Um, I believe there's been some, you know, I'm, again, I'm not an expert on this, but I believe there's been some legislation recently, I think in New York that, you know, that really uh, put a lot of people in the building industry kind of into a tailspin. This, this is what people are telling me, at least, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the thermal uh, ratings on these buildings, you know, you got all these glass buildings and they said they kind of put the, you know, laid the gauntlet down saying, you know, and I'm not an expert. I know it's like our values and all that kind of stuff some specific R value. They said that all buildings in New York City, all new construction meets, must meet the standard. And um, so that's, from what I understand, going to really drive demand for alternative, you know, you're not going to just see these glass, everything's glass, glass, glass. You're going to see a little bit more diversity in terms of, you know, the companies are going to have to do different things in order to kind of get that because it's difficult to achieve that kind of thermal insulation with glass, you know, you, light goes in, you know, it's, it's a very, uh, it, you know, it's very susceptible for warming and cooling from the sun. You lose a lot of, uh, of thermal energy. So having that air gap of a ventilated facade where you have that column of air in between, you know, that really does a whole lot in terms of helping to better insulate. You basically turn a skyscraper to a giant thermos <laughs> is, is kind of my understanding. Um, so I think there's going to be continued, uh, you know, I think regulation's going to, you know, keep driving things forward. I think companies are going to keep driving things forward. And I think design is going to keep driving things forward. You know, uh, there's, there's great artists, there's great, you know, a lot of these architects are doing really beautiful things. And I think people are always going to want, you know, uh, nice looking buildings. People, you know, there's the competitiveness where, you know, IBM and Apple and these big companies, they want to have the the shiniest, uh, you know, fanciest looking building out there. And to a certain extent, I get that. And so there's going to be those pressures that are going to be pushing that. And so that's my take, I guess, as a somewhat outsider <laughs> into the industry. We attended, uh, they, they, there was a new uh, trade association that they put together. I believe it's called Reina now. Um, so that'll be a plug for, for, for those guys, if any of you people are watching. Um, and you know we're trying to learn as much as we can so we attended they we got we got on this email list we were fortunate enough to get on this email list to, as to be kind of on the ground floor of them putting this together and um, so we sat in on that you know first meeting where they're discussing you know do we need a trade show for the ventilated facade industry and you know that's where we kind of learned a lot of that context that you know it's really kind of a, a young uh, industry in the U in the US too there's a lot of misconceptions out there they have their own challenges in terms of you know, building awareness of what is a ventilated facade. And I think even among people in the building trade, I don't think there's a great understanding of what ventilated facades are, what the benefits are. And I think there's still a lot more uh, market share to be gained from that kind of technology.